Hello, 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 good evening. It is my great honor and pleasure to welcome you into our Perseverance Theater virtual space once again. Thank you so much for tuning in to this Black Alaskan History Month lecture, storytelling and poetry live stream. I am so excited for our pres presenter, our guest, and uh, I will introduce them in just a moment. But as you know, we do, it's our wonderful practice, we're passionate about this, um, to acknowledge, to have you join us, invite you to join us, and acknowledge that we reside on the unceded territories of the Occoquan, also known as Juno and Douglas, Alaska. And if you would, I also invite you to put in the chat the lands upon which you are set, the traditional lands where you are zooming in from or uh, tuning in from on our YouTube or on our uh, Facebook page. So if you wouldn't mind that, we'd love you, for you to participate with us. Thank you so much for that. And we acknowledge that Klinket peoples have been stewards of this land since time immemorial. And we are grateful for that stewardship and incredible care. We recognize this series of unjust actions that attempted to remove them from their land which includes uh, forced relocations and the burning of villages, right where Perseverance Theater's base is located. We honor the relationships that exist between Klinket peoples, their lands, their ancestors, and future generations. We also aspire to work toward healing and liberation, recognizing our paths are intertwined in the complex histories of colonization in Alaska. We acknowledge that we arrived here by listening to the people's elders, lessons from the past, and these stories carry us as we weave a healthier world for future generations. We also invite you to join us in honoring and expressing deep gratitude to the Denina peoples of South Central Alaska, where we also conduct our work in what is known as Anchorage, Alaska. So join us, please, in finding ways to recognize, honor, and enact this acknowledgement in meaningful ways. Because for, for more than 10,000 years, Alaska Natives have been and continue to be in integral to the well-being of Alaska. One cannot be without the other. To love Alaska and call it home requires honoring this truth. Alaska is and always has been a Native place. And it is our responsibility to act accordingly. As a creative company, we are committed to learning from meaningfully, including holding space and strengthening our work with Alaska Native peoples. And uh, we know their brilliance, vibrant languages, cultures, ways of life, and relationships with all aspects of their worlds bring knowledges and understandings that we cannot know or access without their consent or partnership. We seek to build a right relationship with the native peoples of Alaska because it will make our work better. In fact, it already has, and because it truly is the right thing to do. So Perseverance Theater honors and respects the culture, traditions, languages, and ways of life of the Alaska native and all native indigenous ancestors, elders, and their descendants past present, and of course, into the future. So with that, gunashish, hawa, indoyaksin, chinan, and kuyana. Thank you. So once again, thank you for tuning in with us. Um, as you know, um, we had our guest was posting on Facebook throughout the, the Black uh, History Month. But we also feel that every month is Black History Month. We can always be learning about Alaska, about our neighbors, our communities, and certainly those who have been marginalized where those stories have maybe been suppressed, forgotten, or maybe not even archived. So uh, we are grateful to be here. And I can share with you that um, I learned today, because I love learning history, that from a colleague, that you can have a fixed mindset or a growth mindset. And I would venture to say it's healthier to have a growth mindset because you're willing to learn and expand. And Alaskans, you are so adventuresome. You are willing to go out into all the conditions and you share and exchange and show such love for 
Alaska and your fellow Alaskans that I would say you have a growth mindset. So I am grateful for that and I'm honored to be here in this in the communities of Alaska. So with that, we have an amazing adventure this evening. And it is my honor and pleasure to uh, introduce our presenter for this evening. Our presenter is MC Mahogany Magnetic, who resides in Anchorage, Alaska, at her Wonder Woman Wonder Dome, AK Camp Magnetic. She's a prolific writer who is cooler than ice, uh, highly educated in anthropology, English, creative writing, and forensic scientist. We have a brilliant human with us here this evening that will present. Wow. Uh, MC Mahogany is also a Coast Guard veteran, community organizer, and a human rights advocate who is world-renowned, nationally recognized, and locally accepted as the undisputed people's champ because she believes poetry is therapeutic. We know that. Poetry, storytelling, it absolutely heals us and affirms our humanity. So thank you for that, MC Mahogany. Also a little bit more, uh, MC Mahogany, some of her published works include Shh, Be Quiet, Building Fires in the Snow, published in 2016, Acrimonious Black Woman Sparks Climate Change Debate with the President in Alaska Women Speak, published in spring 2019, and Girlfriend, What's Your Recipe for Lemonade? That's a part of the Women Scream, the international poetry anthology of female voices published in 2020. And her first novel, The Mad Fanatic 2098, published in 2020. Uh, her list of accolades also includes jumping over five cars on her bike and chaining herself to a tree for justice, equality, and respect for all people selling laundry detergent pods to crusty children and dusty adults who all just want to be fresh and clean is her favorite pastime. So thank you again for tuning in to Black Alaskan History Lecture Storytelling and Poetry Livestream with our wonderful MC Mahogany Magnetic. Please welcome MC Mahogany with a warm virtual welcome onto the screen. Hello, thank you for joining us this evening. And I have to say to everyone, if you haven't gone through, you know, go ahead and, and, and scroll through our Facebook page, Perseverance Theater pa Facebook page, because MC Mahogany, you have been entering those posts each week about Alaskan um, history. And I have learned so much, it's fantastic. And with that, I know we're having this wonderful evening, this dynamic evening, because of your idea, having created those posts. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, four um, articles, right? And yeah. then I did it much like, this is really good. The people love this mode. Like, you should do more. I said, okay, we'll just make it eight. Well, if we're going to do eight, we might as well go ahead and make it a thing, right? So it's like, Okay, and and I think that this helps though too because like we see the text on on the screen, um, but we all process as Leslie, you know, just started talking about the way we learn. You know, we all learn differently, so it helps to like add some more texture to to that to those words by you know speaking about them and um, more so. I think I want to talk about my process, experience, and, and the discovery of these these different articles because um, as the month went on. <laughs> it was just, oh my goodness, this is so much fun. It's <laughs> popping up, popping up here, popping up there. So yeah, I'm definitely gonna get into get into that a bit. Um yeah, for what this is and have a few poems and some um uh, African and African American stories, folk tales to share with you all, a Nancy the Spider and Bro Rabbit. So we're gonna have a good time. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yes, I wanted to share that. Um, you've been also one of our three curators in our first initiative, uh, Black Alaskan Art Matters. So how wonderful to also uh, just bring forth your gifts 
So getting to know you this evening and your research, because you're a tremendous researcher, I can't wait. I want to just lift up. I thought I saw Marlene Johnson is tuning in. Hello, Marlene. And I saw someone, NK, Alaska. Wonderful. Thank you for tuning in. Please put your questions in the chat, your comments. Feel free to participate. We'll be monitoring. And we just love that interaction. So with that, MC Mahogany Magnetic, everyone, I will leave you to it. Thank you so much for joining us. Good night. Wa in Doyaksin. Chinan. It's not cheaper to keep her. I'm a bad mama sita. Magnetic radiation going off in your speaker like what? Too many kids, so I'm not gonna cuss. My poetics originate from dark man. I leave every open mic covered in blood spatter. Hold up, time out, let me turn up the sign of bacon cakes. I got the sweetness of calming sugar mama. My lyrics are jelly, so that's why they jam. I'm your host is doing the most, it's making poetry slam. Back up, back up, give me 50 feet. I'm on the mic to make the cipher complete. Your favorite poetess, spitting a verse, even if it rhymes slow, so put the gear in reverse. Your girl over here sparking up mad isms. That's right, you heard me a cataclysm, an explosion, if you will. So let go and act ill with mahogany. Yes, just like the tree. Magnetic, as in magnetically. With that Bagua style kung fu. MC for dropping mad clues. So the ball is in your court. What you gonna do next? I don't showed you my good side and I'm still vexed. There's nothing wrong, you can't fix me. I'm a lady, but still rip off my clothes like Bill Bixby, then turn all sexy green on your ass. Then it's like she hog smash. And your entire paradigm is a terror transform. Game over. Magnetic wins. Insert coin. So yeah, that's my introduction. I had to do that to let people know who I am. But it also helps me like get into the uh, space in, in the head frame of public speaking. And tonight, oh my goodness, we're about to like have a good time talking about some history things here. So as we were talking about uh, just a little while ago, that for I don't know what five six weeks now I've been working writing these articles with the Perseverance Theater about Black History Month, and so I want to start off talking about why it's so important. Black History Month is so important, right? Because um, one of the things that you know we we often hear and people talk about every year, oh, it's 28 days. It's the shortest day of the year. Shortest shortest month of the year. You know, Black History should be you know year round. All this kind of stuff. Well, one of the things I think it's important to know is how this Black History Month came about. Carter G. Woodson, uh, he wrote The Miseducation of the Negro. And um, in that work, he talks about uh, how miseducation is detrimental to not just Africans or at the time it was Negroes, you know, but, um, but to all people, miseducation is just like deadly. And so one of the things that I find that is problematic in, in our lives, in, in our culture today, as we move towards like gaining an understanding is we have like a, a lack of knowledge and information about one another. Honestly, you can't treat me right if you really don't know who I am. You know, you don't know my history, you don't know my past, anything about me. So in a in a like a larger scale, larger sense, we are now we know and we study world history. Marcus Garvey said that too. Read and study history insistently. If not, you'll be ignorant of the world and of mankind. I mean, that's just like, you know, good stuff. And Marcus Garvey was like, it was like 100 years ago, uh, 1915, Marcus Garvey organized like 50,000 people in Harlem. But, you know, he really drilled this idea of um, knowing history, studying history, learning the importance of it, and also talking about Pan-Africanism and, and African people throughout the diaspora. So um, with that being said, I would like to uh, first, start off like, you know, here in chronological order, not necessarily the order in which these are were made that you see them up online. Because I mean, this is history, right? So it's names, days, times, you know, all that boring stuff nobody really cares about and kind of looks over. However, check this out. If you pay a little bit more attention, you know, other than those names, those, those, those dates and years, you'll find out that Betsy uh, Couture in 1896, is the first African American businesswoman, business person in a uh, businesswoman in Alaska in Skagway, 1896. So she had two 
restaurants that we know of for sure. One was titled, uh, the name of the restaurant was The Kitchen, and then she owned another restaurant that she co-owned with her husband. I think that was um, Broadway Restaurant and Bakery. Now, there's a debate about a third one, which they used to call a black and white restaurant, but it may have just been a nickname for um, The Kitchen. But nevertheless, you know, the cool thing that I found out about in, a, in addition to her being the first business um, black woman to own a business here, in 1930 and the 1940s census records, we see, um, oh yeah, yeah, we gotta talk about uh, uh, snake hips. Okay, right, right, right. So anyways, Bessie Couture, 1930 and 1940 census, she's listed as a homeowner, which is very atypical for any woman in America at that time. We have an image here of, um, Snake Hips Lula, and she was like from uh, Dawson City, and she was notorious around the turn of the century. When I say the turn of the century, I'm talking about from the 1900s to the to the 20s to the 2000s, right? Um, right, we're in the 21st century now, so we're talking about the turn of 19th to the 20th century. So at the turn of the century, you have all these women here in a, uh, in Alaska that like came up here and they saw you know this niche in, in the sex work, right? These men working, you know, the the uh, gold, uh, gold mining and whatever, the pipeline, all those great things. And so, but there were like, you know, they wanted time with women, and these women like here, they ran brothels, the whole nine. But they wasn't just like, you know, throwing any money away. They amassed great amounts of wealth, power, uh, economic power, political power, so much so that and um. Women in Alaska uh, had full rights to vote in 1913, which was seven years before the 19th Amendment and the ratification, the ratification of the 19th Amendment. So when women in Lower 48 got the right to vote. So I mean, just just really uh, fascinating stuff there. So what else was going on around that time period? You know, shortly after around 1901, 1902 to 1907, I think. Um, the Buffalo Soldiers. Now, I was really, really excited about this find because I'm an Army brat before I moved up here to Alaska um, for the first time in, in 93. We were living in Fort Huachuca, Arizona, which is like 30 minutes away from the border of Mexico. And every time you get onto that, that base, whatever, there's a statue of a Buffalo Soldier. And I had no idea what a Buffalo Soldier was until many years after I left. Um, <laughs> Arizona, and then I found out about Buffalo. So I said, oh my gosh, I saw that all the time. But to find out that the Buffalo Soldiers, like, so of the um, Company L, the 125th Regiment, were had made their way to Alaska. Now, they was called the Buffalo Soldiers out of respect and dignity. They, they showed during those horrible wars of moving the indigenous people from their lands, to also during the Spanish-American War as well, too. So all that bravery. So they came up here, um, you know, to law and order type of stuff and everything uh, for quite some time. Yeah, that's a wonderful picture of them um, marching through the streets in, in Skagway. And other than, you know, them, you know, uh, the work that they did, they was well known as very good baseball players. And so much so that it's like there's three teams, I think, in the area and they would play amongst one another. And so like the people was really upset when, you know, it was time for Company L to leave and Many of the soldiers, when it was time for the, um, the enlistment was up, you know, left the military altogether. Some moved on, went to places like, I think, Montana, Seattle area and everything. Very few of them stayed up here. Yeah, there's, that's just really, really awesome information. So along the same lines, when we're talking about the, the, the soldiers, right, we had the Buffalo soldiers. The other thing that I've always, like, heard since moving up here in Alaska is to talk about the trans Alaska Pipeline. And I did remember, like, when I was here in the 90s, when I was much younger than I am now, that there was, like, oh, the African-American soldiers, have, you know, they built the pipeline. Well, I come to find out they built, like, 40% of the of the Alaska um, pipeline completed it um, sooner than, than it was uh, expected. That was one. And also, they didn't have the, uh, the use of the power tools like the white counterparts did. So they used hand tools to construct you know, big stretches of the highway until it was complete. So it's just a major, you know, uh, feat, a major accomplishment. And and we all know what, you know, what it's like to be here. I have, So far, I have not had the opportunity to drive down the Alcan, Alaska, Canada Highway. Uh, but nevertheless, so the next time you find yourself on that path, you know, there's some more history there involved. And 
you know, a few African Americans were in, involved in that. So uh, I want to take the time out real quick. You know what I'm saying? It's burning up. I need to drink some water. So yeah. Um, hmm. I have a poem here, right? It's about, I have a poem here and it's about grimy mofos on the moon. And it was inspired by some grimy mofos on the moon. And I just want to give credit where credit is due. A virus done got my sister now with grimy mofos on the moon. She done lost her taste and her smell while grimy mofos on the moon. I can't pay these high ass doctor bills while grimy mofos on the moon. 10 years from now, I'll be paying still with grimy mofos on the moon. The man just upped my rent last night while grimy mofos on the moon. No toilets, no hot water, no lights, but grimy mofos on the moon. I wonder why he's upping me, because grimy mofos on the moon, I was already giving him 150 a week for grimy mofos on the moon. Streaming services taking my whole damn check. Anti-maskers making me a nervous wreck. The price of cable, GCI, is going up. And if all that wasn't enough, a virus done got my sister now with grimy mofos on the moon. She done lost her taste and her smell while grimy mofos on the moon. With all that money I made last year for grimy mofos on the moon, I wonder why there's no money here. Hmm, grimy mofos on the moon. You know, I've just about had my fill of grimy mofos on the moon. I think I'll send these Netflix bills overnight delivery to grimy mofos on the moon. <laughs> I love that piece. That's an uh, a old, actually, uh, cover of Gil Scott Heron's uh, work uh, in 1969 that uh, was titled um, Whitey on the Moon. And so uh, that was one of the projects that I had going on. The Black History Month was like, you know, create, you know, writing this cover. So I did it, made it on. I just wanted to share that with you all. And uh, so let's get back into it. Let's get back into it. Now I'll tell you, this piece right here, um, I think I was like about 14, 15 years old. And I was mad. I, I was mad. Just as much as, as I was mad the day I found out that Christopher Columbus did not discover America. You know what I'm saying? That's like absurd. That's like I'm here in my house all day or whatever and stuff. And somebody busts in and say, oh, Mahogany, I just discovered you. I was like, what are you talking about? I've been here, right? So anyways, I digress. But Matthew Henson, right? So when we talk about the discovery of the North Pole. And it was highly debated at the time, right? Um, Real Admiral uh, Perry was his name received credit, right? And like almost a hundred years went by before the actual credit was given to Matthew Henson because during the exploration, um, Perry could not go too much any further. You know, he had to stop. So Matthew Henson and four other uh, indigenous uh, Alaskans um, made their way to the, the uh, geographic North Pole. Now we're not talking about the magnetic North Pole for all you real you know, science geeks out there, the geographic North Pole. And they made their way, uh, so they're given the credit of, of discovering the North Pole. Um, cool thing, one of the cool things about Matthew Henson is that while he was in Alaska, he spent a lot of time with people learning languages, um, culture. Um, he even like mar married a, a woman. And they had a child. I married a year later. Yeah, because I said like, that's kind of scandalous. But nevertheless, you know, he had a child. Uh, with, with this woman, I can't remember the, the, the child's name, but like um, in 2009, I think 100 years um, after to celebrate the anniversary of the discovery of the North Pole in 1909, I think that's correct. Um, some of many of his descendants was there, and you know they was you know really, uh, they was honored, and at the time um, President Barack Obama was there and acknowledged the, the achievements of Matthew Henson and, and recognized his, his family and his lineage. For the work that he was done. I mean, discovering the North Pole is, is, is major, right? So, um, oh yeah, another cool fact that I found out that uh, Taraj P. Henson, the actress lady, uh, I don't know if you ever seen Acrimony or um, what's that one movie, that Tyler Perry movie, I Could Do Bad All By Myself. 
she's in a lot of good movies and stuff, but she's a descendant of Matthew Henson as well, too. So it's like, wow, that's some really, really cool stuff to know. And so that puts us, um, now we like moving into the area of um, the time where we talk about the, the Alaska spotlight. Yeah, there we go, the Alaska spotlight. Now, okay, so I know I just said everything was cool, but this was like the coolest thing that I found in the middle of the night. Um, and, you know, like I said, this stuff is online. You go to the Perseverance, like Facebook page, and we're going to get up on the website soon. But, so you also have the links. But you want to take some time to really look at this, right? So when I first saw it, I was like, okay, cool. This is I found the first African-American newspaper. I think it was like 1950. Two or yeah, 1952 because it was set, it was quite a few years before Alaska was actually a state. The state that was 1954, so this was prior to that. And um, but I was like, oh my gosh, this is so wonderful. Um, and I was like, okay, who did this? You know, who who published it? Who the people behind it? And I was like, no, Mo, you don't need to do all of that. This you have text here, right? And we have all this wonderful text that is that is in this newspaper. This weekly newspaper. So what you find out here and what it was like for African Americans in Alaska and just some stories around the world for one week in the summer of 1952. And you have this lady, she's in the corner. She has a column in, in, the, in the paper. And uh, in it, she's talking about, you know, the, the, her day, her trip to Seward with the family that weekend and how great it was. And then there's this other lady, I think her name is Maddie Hay, and she's just in the paper for being cute, right? <laughs> it's like, Maddie, hey, she's the cute, you know, hostess over at the, uh, I can't remember the name of the club now because I can't see it. There's other cool things in there, right? You find out like in that time, you can buy a brand new Buick for, uh, what, $2,895, right? You know what I'm saying? That's good stuff. And, um, oh yeah, so there's Shiloh Baptist Church. That was the first time I've seen any mention of Shiloh Baptist Church that far in the historical records. Um, but for whatever reason, they had to evacuate um, the church service on a Sunday, but everybody was doing fine. That same weekend, and like two people, two members of the choir got married. Um, there was a sale going on. What's the name of that place? A clearance sale at the Smart Shop or something, right? So that's that's like a cool thing, too. So you not only do you get to see like uh, these little stories, these anecdotes, um, but you also get to know, like, okay, what the business was like. You can get a view if there was a summer clearance sale going on. Uh, the GOP, you know, uh, moved their office to, to uh, Anchorage for the first time during, during that week, their time frame. Then there's another story, which was kind of a very heartbreaking one. But um, this man, I can't remember his name now, but he was um, he was tried. He was he was going almost sent to prison, but then you know he was acquitted for helping African Americans, him and six or seven, six or five other people were uh, were charged with facing prison time, like 15 years in prison for helping African Americans buy homes in white neighborhoods. You know, so you're talking about what 1952, right? Um, legal segregation in, in America until 1954, well, you know, Plessy versus Board of Education, right? So, um, but so, yeah, it was illegal to help someone buy a house, you know, and, and they was facing 15 years, like, in prison. And I was like, what the, you know, oh, my God, I was about to start cussing again. Uh, but, yeah, it's, like, just this awesome stuff. So the Alaska Spotlight, and, you know, we get an opportunity to really take some time and, and look at that. Um, and hopefully, you know, when you get an opportunity to go back in the library and stuff and actually go through the archives and find some things. So... Where are we at now? Still in business. Okay. Zulu Swanson. Okay. So <laughs> it seems like it's a lot to lot to cover in you know a little bit of time. Uh, but before we, you know, we go with, you know, start to, okay, there she is. There's Zulu, right? Because like this morning, I said, man, let me do a post. You know, saying so this event's gonna be so cool, right? It's gonna be cooler than the polar bear's toe now. It's gonna be cooler than the Polar bear sipping ice water from a glacier. I was like, but so I was like, oh, man, I gotta find a good like meme or image. And I said, like, oh my goodness, here's one with Zulu Swanson, right? The first African American millionaire, uh, 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and stuff. Same thing, you know, since she found a niche in the market or whatever, 
Randy's brothels, and, and she immediately bought property, right? I mean, property of property. She owned like quite a bit of what we know, actually downtown Anchorage, right? If you consider Fifth Avenue Mall was, you know, maybe the suburbs, right? In, in, in during that time period or whatever. So um, she owned quite a bit of land there. And I think it was like 1962, 64 or something. Uh, uh, she sold her, a portion now, not not all of it, a portion of her land to J.C. Penney's, and that's where the Fifth Avenue Mall, the J.C. Penney's, that it sits today. And so Zula, I had a home over um, in Goose Lake. So if you if you're familiar with the geography of, of Anchorage, if you can just imagine that the mall was considered suburbs, you know. So to be at Goose Lake, you know, which is only like I think about six seven miles from downtown altogether. Um, that's like living out in the boonies, like really, really far out. And she had a house on the lake. And I read some things, I heard some things that she actually owned the entire lake at one time. However, when she passed away, um, I think her the husband that was there, whoever was there at the time, you know, ended up burning the house down. It wasn't insured, so all of that is lost. However, I understand that there has been um, Chester Creek uh, Trail, the people who do upkeep that, the parks uh, department have like tours that they've done tours there from, from time to time of our house. But it's really significant, um, Zulu Swanson's story. To me it is because like, I, you know, when I came across, uh, learned first learned about her was a couple of years ago. Uh, I was um, sitting in, a, um, uh, it's a master thesis, master's students, graduate students at UAA. We had an English conference there, and one of the students was talking about this narrative of Zulu Swanson. So the, the first opportunity uh, came, like, okay, we're going to do these articles. Definitely got to do Matthew Henson. Definitely got to do Zulu Swanson. So I'm just happy to have that, that there. Um, so, yeah, let's talk about, yes, a Black Alaskan art history. But before that, how about a story, right? Would y'all like a story? Mm. So this story is titled A Nancy and a Yam Hills. So other than being a historical archaeologist, um, poet, and a bunch of other things, I am a storyteller, right? And um, so I've been working since like last fall with the young people and bringing them stories. And I've noticed that, you know, yeah, okay, you know, these stories initially designed folk stories are told to children. But nevertheless, they're just a lot of fun in general. And I just love telling the story, especially a Nancy in the Yam Hills. So a Nancy in uh, West African literature and folk tales was represent the, the trickster character, right? So you see all these stories about a Nancy um, being slick and sly and fooling people and everything. So, but this particular story starts off talking about there was a woman um, and for whatever reason, her parents gave her the name Five, right? And so everywhere she went, you know, people, you know, friends would see, like, hey, you know, Five or whatever, you know, and 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 and, and make jokes at her and stuff like this. And she hated it. She did not like the name Five. So when she grew up and she grew old, you know, she got you know learned a little bit of magic and everything. She cast a spell that if anyone said the word Five, they'd disappear. And let me tell you, this this is this is real stuff here. Cause just last week when I was at the cars, you know what I'm saying? And um, you know, the dude was in the checkout line, you know, he had his mask on, but I could hear what he was saying, right? So, you know, the cashier taking his money and everything. And so he's like counting out his money, like one, two, three, four, five. <gasps> and he disappeared. Oh my goodness, like in the middle of the cars, you know what I'm saying? I don't even know if they caught it on camera or not, but nevertheless, right? So a Nancy was like really hip to this, right? So Nancy decided that, you know, um, and, you know, trick people, right? So and Nancy's out in front of the grocery store, and he has these 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 yam hills, right? So you know what yams are? Sweet potatoes. I made me think about Thanksgiving, some yam fries. Oh, my goodness, I love yam fries. So they're like potatoes, but they're orange and they're sweet, right? Okay, so anyway, and Nancy's out in front of the grocery store. And so... Uh, Brother Bull comes out the the grocery store, and Nancy's like, Brother Bull, you know, I'm not that smart. Can you help me count these hills out? So Brother Bull, you know, put you know, all his bag of groceries, whatever, put them down and stuff. 
So he's like, okay, count them out. And so Brother Bull goes, one, two, three, four, five. And he disappeared, right? So then the Nancy took Brother, Brother Bull's groceries, went home, had a good time eating, you know what I'm saying? Cooked everything Brother Bull had, right? Had a good time. So then, you know, and Nancy just keeps going. Goes in the store or whatever and stuff. And like uh, Sister Snake is in front of, you know, coming out of the grocery store with all her bags of groceries and everything. And then Nancy does the same thing. It's like, I'm not that smart. Can you help me count out these jam hills? And Sister Snake goes, one, two, three, four, five. Oh, my goodness. And she disappeared, too. So, okay, and Nancy's on the street right here, right in front of, you know, the Kroger's right here on Minnesota and Northern Lights, you know, because it's the one by my house. So that's why that, that one's in the story. Otherwise, it would be the Red Apple and Mountain View for the kids. Nevertheless. So check this out. Uh, Mama Guinea Pig was coming out of the, the, the cars, right? Coming out of the grocery store. And she heard about Nancy and what Nancy was doing. So Nancy, once again, like, Mama Guinea Pig, can you help me count these yams, these yam hills out? And so Mama Guinea Pig was like, okay, here we go. One, two, three, four, and the one I'm standing on. And, and Nancy's like, no, that's wrong. Do it over. So she said, okay, fine. One, two, three, four, and the one I'm standing on. And Nancy's like, no, no, that's so wrong. That's not how you do it. So Mama Guinea Pig was like, well, tell me, and Nancy, how to do it. One, two, three, four. And Nancy disappeared. Good story, right? Good times. <laughs> so yeah, uh, I have a lot of fun uh, with art. I have a lot of fun with history, a lot of fun with poetry, storytelling, and bringing these narratives uh, to life, right? And I just did a piece um, last month about um, a choreo poem um, with color laces considered pool tabs, they last $2. And so one of my friends is like, you know, that was involved and it was like, you know, I don't even know what a choreo poem is. And, you know, my thing is, it's like, I didn't make this up, right? This comes from a legacy, a, a history of it. And so since, um, definitely since the fall, we did the Black Alaska Arts Matter virtual art show with the Perseverance Theater. Uh, myself, I was a curator along with Alyssa Quentin. And shout out to Alyssa and Amable Rosa, curators. Okay, so anyways, so we was, you know, we was talking about it then, um, about curating this art show, what is Black Alaskan art? And um, at the time I said, well, let's look at the history of it. And I couldn't find anything past 2016 um, digitally, you know, meaning I couldn't find anything online. So it's like, okay, cool, whatever. We still did the art show. It's like, well, you know, we just have to make it up as we go. So over the last month, when I started really doing these articles, it's like, gosh, I really want to really, you know, bring this home um, and really talk about Black Alaskan art history because it's the one that's giving me the most trouble. And I, I still got to say it's giving me the most trouble. Um, but it required something different of me, right? So whereas the other articles require historical archaeology, which is where you, t oh my gosh, I forgot the artifacts. We got artifacts. We'll, we'll put them up on, on, on the site later. But there's artifacts from the um, Camp Skagway, the, the soldiers there, Company L, that I wanted to share. Forgot about those. But um, so <laughs> nevertheless, um, oh goodness, I lost my train of thought. So yeah, so we're looking at the, um, the history of Black Alaskan arts here. Right, and it required me to do something different, right? Whereas the other stories require like you know, finding those documents um, and getting the information from from documents, first accounts, the census records. You know, um, I got some some pamphlets, some brochures, all kinds of little things like this. The newspaper itself is considered the first um, level document, right? But to get the black arts in Alaska stories and histories, that I had to do more ethnographic things and talking to people and asking people about this and about that. Because I remember um, while I was doing a performance, uh, the One Minute Play Festival, and I was hanging out with Vivian Meldy at the time, and she was telling me about this production of For Color Girls to Consider Suicide When a Rainbow is Enough by Intizaki Shange, which was 1994. And so when I had my you know my debut, my, my choreo poem a few weeks ago, she's like, yeah, Mo. Um, my first directorial debut was Colored Girls, and here I am in 
and that was 94 and here in 2021 here i am with uh with, with my piece right along the same lines so i was like oh cool i'm gonna talk to you more so i talked to her more then i had to call mama shirley springer stadna and everything and, and and ask her some questions but she's been here quite some time performing in arts here in alaska as well too so she was able to like boom reinforce some things that i uh, had found and the cool thing was is that when i started talking to people and they started telling me things i got new keywords you know to plug in there into the computer so i was very fortunate and i'm really really proud to find that um there was um the black artist association 1972 to 1980 they have archives in the consortium library the uaa library right that's like on the very top floor you know you gotta wear a special glove to get in in addition to wearing your mask so but that's there and so i also found the, the black arts association for 72 to 1980 then uh, the kumba black artist network was like 81 to 1983 so um both Vivian and uh, uh, Mama Shirley was able to like explain to me like you know their involvement with it and some of the things that they did and the people and it was just really really just wonderful uh, amounts of information that was coming in and so then just like in, in like uh, in in speaking with uh, Leslie Ishii last night I was like oh my goodness I'm having some some issues here with getting this this presentation together we start talking about August Wilson. Right, and August Wilson, I don't know what year it was, but uh, came to Valdez, Alaska, you know, one time. And Valdez, Alaska, as small as it was, even after oil spill, so having these major, major artists, you know, come come to the area and do these great productions, uh, or just to visit or receive an award. That's what he was there for. So, and I was like, oh my goodness, Leslie, the uh, Joe Turner's come and gone. It's an August Wilson piece. Uh, it first, uh, I think, uh, premiered in 1984. But we performed that at East Anchorage High School in, in, in uh, class in 94. And I mean, it was really, really cool uh, to, 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 to see that. So the more I started digging, the more I went through the Anchorage Concert Association's archives, Cyrano's archives, um, the ATC, the uh, Anchorage uh, Theater Community and everything, just more archives of just finding more things. So we see stuff, right, that, that is happening here. but. It only goes so far back as like to 1970. And I was like, okay, okay. There's gotta be more, right? There's gotta be more things that happened prior to 1970. But then I was like, well, there's the other side of this coin too, right? And maybe in 1970s when we just started to begin to see the emergence of African American uh, Alaskan arts here, right? And it's like, that's when it starts. It's not that it wasn't there beforehand or there was, you know, blues singers and performers and, and visual artists before, but we really started to, you know, find stuff in, in the record. And as far as I know right now with the living history that I have oral stories, 1972 is as far back as it goes. So, but it also says something else to me because we can talk about the fact that, well, you know, there's a suppression of, of African-American history in general. We can talk about that, but it's also the fact that like, Maybe this stuff is just really new, right? And when I looked at the, the context of all eight articles and thinking about the entire history since 1896 with Bessie Couture, you know, Matthew Henson, and thinking about the Buffalo Soldiers, thinking about the, the soldiers on the Alcan and Alaska Spotlight, I said, well, this is all business. This is all infrastructure. This is education. This is all politics and stuff. African Americans spent a lot of time doing in the first 125 years. So maybe what is happening now is this the second layer of uh, of colonialism, right? And yes, I call it colonialism. And because we're African Americans, yeah, you know, we was robbed, stolen, beat, you know, over the head, even brought to the Americas, but still to be here on the indigenous land, this is why we got honor and respect the land. We want somebody to land, right? At least for the time being. And with that being said. You know, you move into to this, to this new space. It's been 125 years. It's, it's now, you know, what we're seeing since 1970. It's the time to make art. And that was one of the things that came up during our BAM curator panel discussion, you know, is that why um, the arts that African-Americans are producing are the way that they are. Why are we seeing more like 
rap videos or content type of things and stuff like this is because you know we just didn't have the luxury to be sitting around making art if it didn't make money it did make sense right so otherwise it's a waste of time energy and resources but now we have time and um, more time to to create art and i don't know about you all but for the last year during the pandemic that's all i've been doing with my time is creating art and so and i, I would go so far to say that what we are experiencing right now is our own harlem renaissance right if you're familiar with the Harlem Renaissance, that was exactly 100 years ago, the 1920s to the 1930s. And it was this boom of our artistic and cultural consciousness coming out of all these um, African-American artists, women and men, um, lesbian, gay, just all types of people uh, producing massive amounts of work. This is when you get Lorraine Hansberry. This is when you get Langston Hughes. You get uh, Clyde McKay. You get Zora Neale Hurston all of these people, and then you get the jazz art. Oh my goodness, let's talk about Thelonious Monk, love me some Thelonious Monk. So that was like 100 years ago. So here we are 100 years later. Yeah, we're here in Alaska, and I think this is what's going on. We are at a point now where we are just now building this historical record. We are just now like creating art and everything. So it's, it's relatively new, right? 1970s, it's not that far away. Um, so, <laughs> I just really wanted to, to share that all with you and that I ask that you all continue. If you have any information, other stories, narratives, and when it comes to like history, art, especially African-American art here in Alaska, please send it to me. Send it to Perseverance Theater, post it somewhere, tag me in it, whatever. There's only one MC Mahogany Magnetic on the planet. If there's another one, please let me know so I can bump them off. So nevertheless, I want to I need help. You know, let's build these archives up and it's records so future generations can come. And they don't have to work so hard at like looking at what's already been done. Here's the blueprint. This is how you do a choreo point. And this one, I'm so thankful for Ntozaki Shange. She showed me how to do a choreo point. I did the choreo point. Now, come on, come, come on now. Let somebody else do a choreo point. Let's get this thing popping off in all kinds of wonderful directions. So yeah, um, just, just good stuff. And uh, I share, what about another point, right? Then we have some time for some question and answers. Good? Okay. Um, yeah, so while shopping for berries in the produce section, a Facebook friend came with a sincere confession. I kid you not. I tell you, no lie, Mahogany. Ever since I've been following you, I got a new house and a color TV. Everyone loves the way I get down. Thanks to you, I'm now the spice around town. Well, there's no reason to thank me, and that's true, and you must believe in something. Why not believe in you? I may be shining, but it ain't all about me. Enjoy your new house and color TV. While you're at it, you might as well download my new movie. But for now, you're standing in front of bananas I need for my smoothie. Now, I like to play and go full throttle, but I must accept myself as a role model. I can do a lot of things. I can get on the mic and make your body swing, but... I wouldn't be a friend at all if I didn't tell you to stand tall in the face of adversity, love others and accept diversity. We're all different and strange when folks call us out of our names, saying things that hurt, that just not so, have you feeling all down, blue, sad, and low. That's why you speak your voice so they can hear the sound of your frown turning upside down. All cheers for you, the people's champ. Put it in the envelope, seal it with a stamp, with a letter that reads, I am somebody and I deserve respect. I may be young, but don't forget, I have a right to be happy, weird, nerdy, athletic, introverted, and sassy. As far as I can tell, crack is whack as hell, meth is straight up death, and Spice and Molly are just so lost, and I want to grow up to be the boss of a Fortune 500 or maybe a small bakery, but then I like science, so maybe archaeology. Just question the truth, children. You can be whatever you want to be. Me, I prefer to be a Wonder Woman. When I'm held back, I just keep on coming to arrive at my goals. Who you become, no one else knows. Really, it's your choice. It's your life. Just don't condone the bullying and strife. Try writing your dreams on paper. Adjust your shoulders off to dismiss the haters. Practice your skateboard or hula hoop. Have a salad, maybe some soup. Take a break from fast food so you can be stronger and in better moods. And remember, no one can ever take away your knowledge. Well, I guess I've said enough, so I wish y'all the best growing up. 
Yeah, how's not drugs? Be cool, stay in school. You don't need riches when you have wealth. And above all, just be yourself. Oh my goodness. Let's get into the questions and the answers for a little while. <laughs> If there are any. Oh my gosh, wonderful. I have to give you my virtual applause. Bravo. Thank you, MC Mahogany Magnetic. Wow. Poetry. Imagination. Yes. Oh, right. Just sit awesome. here and not in front of no real audience or whatever. It's just. Oh, there we have an audience. It's wonderful. I just want to lift up. Thank you so much. Poetry, storytelling, the history. Um, I love that line, the spice around town <laughs> and black Alaskan art renaissance. I think that's what's next for us. And the North Pole, Alaska Spotlight, Zula Swanson, just to name a few. And of course, our dear uh, Entazaki Shange and August Wilson. Wow. What a range of incredible history you shared with us. Um, say, as we get started into our, our q and A, I I want to just lift up that uh, one of our folks on Facebook said, indigenous people lived North Pole through many ice ages, told through stories of our ancestors and people. Wonderful. Yes. So we're doing some responses. We've got some wonderful friends that have tuned in with us. Katie, it's wonderful to have you. Marlene, thank you for tuning in. Once again, I mentioned you earlier. Um, so we have lots of wonderful friends with us. Yeah, oh, I, yes, thank you. I, I want to acknowledge Irene Martinko, who you know works with us at Perseverance Theater, is just off, off camera there doing our technical work with us and so creative and brilliant. Thank you, Irene. Um, and as we, we field some questions, perhaps, um, I also encourage folks to keep Mahogany Magnetic going, especially, you know, we're not out of this pandemic yet, but artists always need and love your support. So please don't hesitate. You see the scroll down there at the bottom of the screen to Venmo at mahogany-magnetic and um, uh, support our artists. It, we want everyone to come out on the other side of this pandemic, strong, healthy, and continuing their incredible creativity, their work. Uh, so with that, um, MC Mahogany, I just, I know we might have some questions come up here, but I just want to also lift up um, that you mentioned the Renaissance. Mm, the Harlem Renaissance. The Harlem Renaissance. And you know, in the Midwest, where Penumbra Theater is, where Lou Bellamy, is a founding artistic director who gave August Wilson his first home. They have up through the Midwest, that migration north, they had their own black art renaissance, renaissance there as well. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. We talk about cultural consciousness in, the, in it, how it expands. Um, and because there's a lot of things popping off, right? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. We are, we're here at the beginning of the 21st century, you know, 100 years from, from you know, from that. And honestly, look at it historically, you know, saying so we're just coming out of the, the Spanish flu pandemic, you know, yeah. like, boom. So, you know, and not, not to be so drab, I mean, but history piece itself, honestly, another depression is coming in the next decade. You know, mm -hmm. those, if, you know, if we don't study history, we do repeat it, so they say, right? Yeah, but right. also some good, good lessons to, you know, to learn, we're not too far different and things are happening across the nation and the world right now. Very mm -hmm. wonderful. Oh, say, I see a question here um, um, from, I think it's uh, Pateri Light. How many new colleagues have you met through this project? Have you inspired more vigorous investigation or creativity? Um. Here, I'll say, I'll ask again while you think. How many new colleagues have you met through this project? Have you inspired more vigorous investigation or creativity? Good question. Thank no, you. No new colleagues, but there's one person I want to meet. I want to meet and, and you know get some time. So there's, there's two people. One is Cal Williams because I've been like watching some of his, his things on, on on Facebook. He's a uh, historian here, African American. He tells all these wonderful stories about local Alaskan histories. And then Ian Hartman, uh, he just published uh, a book with the National Park Services um, um, last year. And it's tight, it's a horrible title, I know Ian. But uh, <laughs> uh, 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 Black History on the Last Frontier, right? We really want to get away from that type of terminology, but it is what it is that was published. 
mm-hmm. and uh, the National Park Service is bringing these, these stories and these narratives out. What I understand, they're going to continue to do, do some more of that. So, but I haven't met anyone uh, new, um, but I just had new conversations with some old friends about things that we hadn't talked about before like with uh, our history. What was the second part of that question? Um, yeah, so- Investigation and creative, yeah. Yeah, it, it, investigation and creativity, it was like, oh my goodness, I find it so much information. One thing opens up another door, here's a window, boom, 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 here's a new path, well, take this, take this. Like, you gotta stop, Mahogany, go to bed. It's almost 10 o'clock, time to watch the murder she wrote, you know? But I mean, this is so, so much information. And when we, like when we talk about uh, history, we talk about culture, the more we talk about it, you, you know, more you pick up things, at least I do. Yes. Especially uh, talking to people who are older, who have been involved, and you get these oral stories and the oral histories. Just like someone mentioned uh, the, the comment about the indigenous people been here for yeah. ages and, and these, these narratives of oral history stories. And I wanted to like come back to that and like point out that what I'm talking about, when we talk about, you know, the first do this, the first do that, that's the first stuff that's written on paper, right? And, you know, wow. right, that's that's written on paper. And that's, that's European ideas, philosophy, uh, way of thinking and stuff. And that's not who we are uh, or as, you know, people, other people of the world. Our oral histories are more important to us than, you know, what's written on a piece of paper, you know? Uh, this is why, you know, I told uh, Nancy, the, the, you know, the spider stories, you know, talking about oral histories here. Um, didn't get into Burr Rap, but maybe for another time. But, you know, and that's valuable. The value of our oral histories to, to some degree is more valuable than what the written text is. Because you get more life, you know, get more energy. You know, when I was talking to Vivian and Shirley, and, you know, yeah, I was, oh, my goodness. Yeah, this is going on. Okay. Oh, my God. Thanks for reminding me, Mahogany. You know, uh-huh. that's good stuff there. Well, I just have to say, Mahogany, MC Mahogany Magnetic, I'm doing a little thinking here because I am the daughter of a forensic scientist. My father ran the Western Washington State Crime Lab, which was the Seattle Crime Lab first, and then they consolidated for all kinds of interesting reasons, which that's a different conversation. But what I think I inherited was as I read your bio, and I just got a chance to get to know you over time now too, you're an anthropologist in English, creative writing, and you're in forensic science. So that forensic scientist loves to investigate, find the clues, and then you're kind of a connector of what about that and creating the logic or the meaning and what we know too, and the anthropological aspects of all that you do looking back, you know, and what we can learn. There's something so interesting, the alchemy of who you are, the brilliance of how your mind works. Can you talk a little bit about that? Just because I think that's, um, that, that's why you're here at this time when we need to uncover yeah. and I, I love, I'm studying right now the epistemology of oppression, which basically says, of especially of black indigenous people of color, our lived experience is actually really valuable. It's critical for us to acknowledge that and to bring it forth. Our histories have been suppressed and or just not everyone got to clock it and move it forward with somebody else or pass it along all the different ways. But like you said, there's been many stories that have been, or discoveries. These are just the ones that got written. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, we're talking about the big record. Here. I love how you're putting all of this together and uncovering and investigating to, to our, our wonderful well, uh, viewers well, question. Yeah. I think since 1996, that's our first archeological dig that I did. I know. Really? Really. Texas, about 45 minutes south of Houston, and it was on the, the Levi Jordan plantation. Um, yeah, that's another story all in itself. So, and I did uh, archaeology in Texas, archaeology in Georgia, archaeology in South Carolina, uh, New York City, um, in, in, in the Hamptons, uh, yeah, the, uh, Long Island area, right? Um, yes. Gosh, I can't remember the name of the area where Hofstra University is out there that way. Uh, the home of Jupiter Hammond, like the first, wow. once again, we're talking about documented, the first uh, published African American writer, Jupiter Hammond. And he's actually published a few years before Phyllis Wheatley was. Um, and they were like, you know, friends at the time. I think there's some letters and records between them. So um, 
archaeology, you know, it, it's the same way with forensic science. We, we know a little bit about forensics if you watch any amount of TV. It's like <laughs> Archaeology takes artifacts, you know, that we find in the ground, but it also takes the written record there too. So you can kind of look at things, right? Um, and and you know, you know, get this 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 larger picture. Historical archaeology also got me into genealogical research, right? And doing family trees and, and, and studies, and that's Absolutely. something that we talk about during Juneteenth time of time period because mm -hmm. families coming together. And mm -hmm. um, so yeah. All these little skill sets that I, that, that I picked up, and then you know to, to study English and you know get this MFA in creative writing. And so one of the things that happened uh, almost ten years ago, uh, I was yeah it's over ten years ago when I was diagnosed with post traumatic stress disorder and by oh. disorder while I was still active duty in the uh, Coast Guard, and um, and I was like oh my gosh like I'm in all kinds of trouble. And I, I mean I struggled for for a long time. I was hospitalized. Like 18 times between 2010 and 2017. Um, mm -hmm. But one of the things that after my first suicide attempt, I was like, okay, I won't do that. And no matter what I'm going to do, I'm going to be me 24-7, 365, whatever that means. That was before I transitioned, right? And uh, But it also, not just you know my, my femininity and my gender, but like I stopped hiding my intellect. Right, because I did that while I was in a for so long. Um, mm. You know, kind of like play stupid, play dumb. Like I didn't know this, though. No, yeah, sure, whatever. You know, just just do the work. Um, but so mm. I, I hear things about by myself. I, I suppress those things about myself. Mm. You know, when I transition, all that just like mm, just like let it all out. So it's like it's uninhibited now. You know, it's like. So like good. Yeah, we have a good time here. Can't it's like the artist in you also combined with everything is beautiful. Then the expression. Oh, so oh, here's another question from Todd Hunter. Hello, Todd. Thank you for uh, offering this question in the chat. I'm wondering if during your research you came across. Oh, I love this question. Okay, let me go again. I'm wondering if during your research you came across any stories related to coalitions or relationships between black and indigenous peoples there in Alaska or your local area. We share so many commonalities and shared oppressions. Oh. Yeah, yeah, well, right off the top, Matthew Henson, right? Um, and we talk, once again, talk about what's documented, but the other four people that was there with them don't have the names of them, just know that they were uh, Alaska natives. Um, at, at the time, who you know, are all credited. There's a photo. Um, I think it's, it's on the, uh, the Perseverance page where you see all five of them together, right? And like I said, mm -hmm. Matt Hansen, like spent a lot of time with you know family learning language and you know fathering you know a child. Um, then you also talk about the um, the Buffalo Soldiers and Skagway, right? So in addition to you know law and order type of stuff, whatever. They were like mitigating the the relationships between the Clinkett and the, the the settlers that was coming in there, and you know, so this is why they was called the Buffalo Soldiers. I mean, they wasn't going there being you know like Europeans and just smashing everyone. They was talking and interacting, you know, and you know, negotiating all those great things and bartering and stuff. So that, yeah, there's, there's there's tons of that, and um and it's like not not to, not to negate it at all. Um, but we're simply here talking about the African American presence in Alaskan history, because one of the things that I've known, I've experienced, and it's talked about um, the past few weeks with people. It's like, well, one of the things all you hear about when you talk about Alaskan history is what the Europeans did or the Indigenous people was doing, and that's that. Everybody else, like in between, we don't talk about the Polynesian community. We don't talk about the mm -hmm. Muslim community. We don't talk about the Senegalese communities here. And all these other cultures and people are here too. Um, and this is what I love about uh, uh, Alaska. And I'm so glad, grateful I went to East Anchorage High School. Uh, was such, such, we talk about multicultural and diversity. Mm. That's here. It ain't no, no melting pot where we're all melting and blending to the same thing. And, you know, and, it, and, it's, and yeah, maybe it's a salad, but this salad, it's got some, you know, more than like, it's got lettuce, tomato, broccoli in there, sunflower seeds, and nutritional ease. You know what I'm saying? Some you know, mm -hmm. ginger for dressing. It's good salad stuff going on here. But yes, all of these people here, and then we, we're not even talking about this. 
you know, these things. And and I hope that, you know, you know, this discussion shines light and we can let's, let's get into it. Let's talk about, you know, the presence of uh Polynesian people here in America. You Absolutely. know, with you know, Captain Cook is still standing over there in, in the harbor. All the other colonizing statues was taken down over the mm. summer. Mm. But, oh no, like you know, da 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 da. Mm. But Captain Cook and I and I was, you know, talking with some people over the summer about it. You have to understand he was a colonizer that went around the world causing damage or whatever. And uh mm. know, Black History Month fact because it happened during the month of February, but February 1974, the Hawaiians stabbed and killed Captain Cook. You know, and my friend, my, one of my Polynesian friends sent me the, the meme. Well, it's not necessarily a meme. It was a, a painting from the time period. You know, this day, you know, Valentine's Day. And they show him, it's like killing Captain Cook. It's hilarious. <laughs> but, you know, those, those are important. We've been talking about all these stories of, of people here. And I'm just, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm African and American, so I know my history and culture. So we just need these other researchers and, and stuff to share things. Yes, and and uh, thank you, Todd Huntington had commented that uh, I think you're you're you've been sharing about what these relationships look like and how we helped each other. You know, uh, makes sense. We know something happened because I have wonderfully so met wonderful community members I consider dear friends, family here that are mixed race, black, uh, Native Hawaiian, and Filipino or Samoan. You know and black so we know that relationships were made came together and um lots was exchanged and shared and and great love too obviously so uh i'm sure there were struggles too obviously so but but what a rich history yes i hear that we is it um our managing director frank delaney uh was born and raised in anchorage and talks about in the Anchorage School District is one of the most diverse school districts in the country. Yeah. yeah in the U.S. And I believe it. I believe it. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I really, I don't know. I mean, I think it's, it's still the same, but even when I, when I was in, uh, when I was in high school, it was, it wasn't just a bunch of different people and everyone sitting at different sides of the lunchroom. We was like all hanging out with all friends. And I'm like, I'm still, <laughs> Day like my classmates like are involved in projects with me. A couple of them was involved in the choreo poem last night, last month in that production and stuff. And you know we continue to to to, to do some some wonderful things. And uh, yeah, but I, I think it's some, it's some authentic multiculturalism that goes on here in in Alaska. Really, you know. And that's, yes. we're not going to forget all the other the racism and all that other stuff. It's not to negate that, but you know, it speaks to yes. the power here. Absolutely. Well, we have just a few minutes left. And I thought if there's any last question or comment anyone would like to make, we'd like to invite you to share that in the chat. Um, and our wonderful Irene Martinko will let us know. Uh, but any last thoughts, MC Mahogany, is in case, you know, as we wait someone might want to comment or share but any last thoughts as we move toward our close here oh my gosh i'm so looking forward not to being smart anymore in five minutes <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if you can help that you're very oh, you're God. just no so I, 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 I gotta turn to let the, the, the switch off i mean <laughs> it's been so fun and i mean i really do enjoy <laughs> Uh, history and learning, uh, and I enjoy culture. So to find stuff like, oh my goodness, this is this this and that's like, and I was like, oh my. When I found the information about you know Betsy Couture and uh, Snake uh, Snake Hips Lula and Black Betty, uh, Black Alice and Gnome and stuff, I was like, it just do a whole piece on like women alone in Alaskan history. And mm. oh my gosh, and then the, uh, I found that the Alaska Women Hall of Fame. You know, a few people, friends I got in there. It's like, oh my God, I know Charlotte Shin Hall of Fame. You know, it's like, <laughs> so I'm really excited uh, about it. Uh, but it's like, okay, this has been quite a bit of, of, of work uh, putting this together. And right before we start, I was telling Irene, I said, you know, other than being history, it just seemed like this has been one big old art project for me. Um, mm, wow. More so than it has been historical things because. One of the things I had to do 
was make sure like these posts still feel like posts, right? And they still feel like mm. personal touch, a personal narrative. Um, and it wasn't just really, really dry. They, on this day, uh, you know, on this day in Black history, they had a, you know, it wasn't that. So, cause like, so several uh, people have commented on, you know, throughout the month or the weeks or whatever. It's like, this is really cool. You know, made my uh, history interesting, Mahogany. This is a lot of fun, you know? So, <laughs> yeah, it became, a, it became an art process too. And like, not only writing about this history, but also, you know, uh, writing in a very creative way about it as well too. Oh, beautiful. We have a comment here from uh, Todd Hunter. Oh, and Todd had asked those questions. Thank you so much for tuning in, Todd. Todd says, thank you so much for sharing your gift and wisdom. Such wonderful, needed, and important information. Thank you, Todd. And I know we had another comment. Oh, yes. He, uh, oh, the, uh, kudos to Mahogany, exclamation, exclamation, and to Perseverance Theater. And Leslie, delightful evening. Oh, <laughs> good for tuning in. And Judith Ireton says, amazing talent and energy, exclamation point. Thank you so much for an informative and entertaining evening. Uh, you're Wonderful. You're well, MC Mahogany, this will not be the last time because I have yet to ask you about this title. Acrimonious black woman sparks climate change debate with the president. Yeah, so it's a short story. Uh, okay, can this be our closing story? Because I, every time I keep thinking, I got to remember to ask you about this. So maybe this is our moment. Okay, 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 okay. Let me see if I can tell you about it really, really short. Yeah. Um, it's a short story. It was published in Alaska Women Speak Spring of 2019, right? And um, so it was while, you know, Trump was in office. And I was like watching the news one day and I was like, wait, is it people living in Trump Tower, right? I'm like, oh my gosh, what's that gotta be like? You know, definitely hell on earth, right? <laughs> Cause like, so, so what I did was I took the, this story is set in Alaska. It's set on the, uh, the, the, the tower that, the, <laughs> that the, the central character lives in is over on fire. We, it's Bernard. Um, and that's like, this, you know, Trump Tower. But I also looked at other things that was going on around Trump Tower, right? There's an ice cream parlor, there's a grill and stuff. So, you know, that brings the brown jug into the, to the mix and other other things right here in my little area. And so then it's like, okay, I live in the, the, uh, the apartment, right? The apartment uh -huh. really ran by the president. So honestly, if he runs the, the country like he runs the, <laughs> The apartment building yeah. like, of the country is going to be some problems. So, you know, so the, the, the central character, you know, she's just like upset, you know, with the people in the, in the laundry room, like putting a timer on how fast you get your laundry done and stuff. And some of these are real personal experiences. Just this, oh my goodness. Uh, neighbors, right? Living in an apartment building. So it gets to a point where she has an opportunity to talk to the manager of the apartment, you know, complex and everything. And she's like, you know, yeah, you know, um, did you, and I think his first question was like, did you read the tweet this morning? You know what I'm saying? All the, the announcements about the apartment building goes out in the daily tweet. It's like, I don't read the tweets. What, what does the tweet say, right? And she's like, she's like going on, it's like, it's hot in here. You know what I'm saying? I'm paying all this money, millions of dollars or whatever, and you know, for this place, and it's so hot in here. Why is it so hot? Can you fix the air conditions? Like, well, ma'am, you know, we, we'll get my team of people and we gonna work on it, but well, if you had team of people running the country like that, then look at this. And so finally, you know, we get to the end, the end of that narrative. It's like, um, yeah, it's just like, yeah, why is it so hot in here? And then, you know, the manager of, you know, because she's talking about climate change, the temperatures mm -hmm. going, and all this kind of stuff. And he's like, well, you know, hell is hot. <laughs> <laughs> hell is hot. Uh, so yeah, so it's just acrimonious climate change debate with the president. Uh, was also the manager of you know her apartment building. That's <laughs> a really clever story. Uh, I, I love it. I haven't it hasn't gotten the, the attention that it probably needs though, but it's a lot of fun. <laughs> awesome. Well, I know that you you've been published many times here, as we mentioned in uh, your introduction. Um, I I think we should figure out on our website how to make sure we list those because. Folks, I'm sure will want to read your articles, your your stories, your poems, um, and your novel. Your novel. So very excited. 
Yeah, the Mad Men yeah. in 2098. Oh really my God. Yeah. This um, project, the one I spent three years working on, went through about eight, nine drafts of it. Um, so, and when I say it's, it's published, it's not on bookshelves, but it's been published in ProQuest because it was a thesis. It is a thesis essay. Um, so, go find it on, on ProQuest and, and read it yourself. Um, and but yeah, I'm looking forward to actually getting with a book, get some distribution on that novel. It's a really, really, really awesome story. Um, yeah, a lot of fun writing it, but yeah, the Mad Fantastic 2098, and it's a, it's a, it expands 100 years and it ends in 2098. And the Great Pearl of Garbage with this epic battle with the old dirty ninja. Like, how did we get here? <laughs> Oh my goodness. Well, MC Mahogany Magnetic, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation for our first Black Alaskan History Matters lecture, storytelling and poetry live stream. You wonderfully brought it forth, brought it all to us. Thank you so much for sharing your gifts with us. It means the world. And I'm sure it won't be the last time we see you, your family now. So you know how that works. Yes. Your house is my house. You know how many times you've been in my house? I mean, oh my goodness, honestly, a lot of people <laughs> in my house now at this point. But yeah, the Wonder Dome. Yeah, the Wonder Dome. Thank you so much. So another virtual round of applause for MC Mahogany Magnetic. Uh, thank you so much. And, uh, you know, I have actually a bit of an announcement to make to share with folks. And that is our next part of this series for uh, Women's History Month. We know that Black History Month is every month. And this month also happens to be Women's History Month as well. They can coincide, live together in the same month. Um, we have on May 20th at 7 p.m. Alaska time, a special conversation with our founder of Perseverance Theater, Molly Smith. And uh, we're so thrilled that Molly will be in conversation with myself and our moderator will be our board member, Allison Holtkamp. So that's exciting. I know Allison has graced our stages many a time in our plays and knows Molly really well. And I've gotten to know Allison, so it'll be a wonderful conversation. We're really excited. Again, May 20th. 7 p.m. Alaska time. And that'll be, oh, I'm sorry. No, I, I, let me take that back. It's 4 p.m. Alaska time because it's 8 p.m. Eastern time for Molly. So again, May 20th, 4 p.m. Alaska time and 8 p.m. Eastern time for Molly. But I also want to, here we are, again, we're in uh, Women's History Month as well. I want to lift up that conversation, but I also want to lift up the wonderful Rose Gattas. I bought my Girl Scout cookies today. Grateful they carry gluten-free coffee task, uh, uh, Girl Scout cookie. So it's cookie time, y'all. If you haven't supported the Girl Scouts yet, please do. This is my chance to also give a shout out to the executive director, uh, Leslie Riddle of Girl Scouts of Alaska. We know supporting our girls who are leaders now, really, they're entrepreneurial. They do research. They uh, get out and they absolutely appreciate the land upon which we set the native place that we live in and they appreciate um, the environment and they're constant learners. They have that growth mindset. They start young and we just want to lift up the Girl Scouts because those young leaders are going to be our women leaders and not that long. Very soon they are our women leaders. So it's an opportunity to lift up the Girl Scouts and Leslie Riddle's leadership and for the leadership of Road to Tass. Thank you for my cookies today. I'm so happy now and thank you for gluten free. <laughs> so with that, oh my goodness, MC Mahogany Magnetic, again, thank you so much for being with us and giving us your generosity of spirit with your wonderful talents, your brilliance. Thank you. We're so grateful. I'm ready to be a superstar. Make my family okay. proud, be a credit to my race, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> Absolutely. You already are. <laughs> Yay. Well, thank you to our audience for tuning in. We'll see you May 20th and we'll have more announcements then. You know, we just keep rolling it out. We're kind of teasing you along here, but we have some really, really fun um, uh, uh, things to reveal and uh, we can't wait. So yay. Thank you for tuning in. Have a good rest of your weekend. Be safe. Wear masks. Get vaccinated. Awesome.